Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be looking this evening at verses 12 through 26. You know, for me, it's been so long since I've been able to do Sunday night services. I actually look forward to, to being here. I'm so happy to be able to come and to teach you tonight, and, and it just blesses me so much. And uh, so I'm so happy I'm going to do my very best to make you miserable tonight as we look at this passage. But as we look at it, what we see here is the Apostle Paul, who basically is making it very clear that the chains that he is wearing, well, the chains that he has are in Christ. And we'll be seeing that today as we look through this passage. We'll begin reading at verse 12. I'll read to verse 18, and we'll get into our study. Beginning at verse 12, Philippians chapter 1, Paul writes, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Now, I want you to notice as we begin in verse 12, he says, I want you to know, brethren, the things which happened to me. Now, what is he speaking about when he says the things which happened to me? What is he referring to? He's referring to or speaking about his arrest and his imprisonment. And so right from the beginning, Paul begins to make it very clear that the circumstances he finds himself in will not control his response. And that's something we can begin with by way of application. We need to remember that we are not victims of circumstance. We have to realize that the Lord is sovereign over everything in the universe, and that includes our lives. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now, when the psalmist said are ordered, that word ordered means established or fixed. It speaks of that which is prepared or appointed. And so when things are not going exactly as we would desire, we need to remember that God is in control. And God uses the circumstances that we find ourselves in in order that he might do a work in our life. The things that I go through are intended by God to perform a work by God. I need to understand that, especially when I'm going through something very difficult. I need to have that eternal framework. I can't be seeing things as, as just the right now. There are a lot of people who live their lives in the right now. It has to be good for me right now. It'll never be good later on. I have to enjoy my life right now. I've discovered, as some of you have, that some things that I go through at that moment are the worst things that I could imagine going through. But God does something through those things that I would have never had any other way. God has a way of working through circumstances. And Paul is saying that. The things that have occurred to me, these things, this, these chains, this imprisonment, have actually worked out for some good, for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The things that I've gone through, Though they may not have been my choice, they aren't the things that I necessarily would have said, I want these things to happen so that I might end up in jail. Well, the bottom line is, is as I see them through an eternal framework, I see that God is doing something through them, and God is working something through them. Paul, when he was writing to the Romans in chapter 8, we all know this scripture, it's found in verses 28 and 29, said this. He said, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And so the bottom line is, is what he was going through was conforming him into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The things that he went through were actually going to work for the good over time. And it would be, as he says here, for the furtherance, notice, of the gospel. That word furtherance. It speaks of that which advances over obstacles and goes through opposition. It speaks of a pathfinder. It speaks of pushing through undergrowth. He's saying, I view these obstacles as divine opportunities. I see God working through them. Now, Paul had wanted to go to Rome. He finally got his wish. He got a chance to go to Rome. 
he had written in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 23, that he, that he had a great desire for many years to come to the Romans. Well, through his trial and his imprisonment, he got his opportunity to be in Rome. Now, why would being in jail in Rome be something that he would rejoice in? Well, because he was arrested on a charge related to his faith. And that became well known to all. Notice verse 13. It has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains, he says, are in Christ. It's become evident. The word evident means to be manifest, to be plainly recognized, to be seen clearly. It has become plainly recognized that I'm in jail for the cause of Jesus Christ. Paul's greatest desire, as we see it, was to take the name of Jesus Christ throughout the entire world. He wanted to take the message of the gospel, even as Jesus had said in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, to the four corners of the earth. He wanted people to know who Jesus Christ was. He wanted people to know that Jesus Christ could save them. He wanted them to know this powerful gospel. And so he wanted to go throughout the world, again to the Romans in chapter 15, verse 20. He said, I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. I want to take the name of Jesus, and I want to spread it to places that people haven't heard. And that was his desire. So being in jail didn't quench his desire to share the gospel. It actually gave to him a, a door of opportunity. And it gave to him a new field to minister to, the palace guard and others. Because notice how it says in verse 13, it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. The palace guard. Now, they put him in a cell. But that didn't mean he had no opportunity to share. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he said, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This, he says, is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But he goes on to say, but God's word is not chained. And so I have an opportunity here. I'm being guarded 24 hours a day by a, a hand-picked elite soldier in, in the service of the emperor, the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard were the emperor's personal bodyguard. So he had an opportunity to speak to these men. Now, at that time, there were about 10,000 who were members of the Praetorian Guard. And these guards would actually be rotated every four hours. So one man would be chained to the Apostle Paul for four hours. Then a second man would come in and take his opportunity to be chained to Paul for another four hours. Can you imagine what that would have been like to be chained to the Apostle Paul? That, that, that was what you really call a captive audience. I mean, there's no way that they were going to get away. And Paul would be there, and the guy would be speaking to him. And if at all, I mean, at first, because he's a prisoner, they probably didn't really want to speak to him too much. But it became evident, he said, that my chains are in Christ. What does that mean? That means he had an opportunity to share with them that I'm not an evildoer. I didn't break the law. What I have been imprisoned for is my message of the gospel. So you can almost imagine the conversation that would be held where somebody says to him, okay, so why are you in? And Paul says, well, for the message. What message? Well, would you like to know what the message is? Absolutely. Well, we got a few hours. Let me share with you. And he would do that. Now, can you imagine that? It's hard to imagine, to be honest with you. I mean, if you locked me up, I'm not quite sure that I'd say, oh, boy, what an opportunity. You know, I'd be looking at those bars, wishing I had some kind of file to get out. I mean, it would be an entirely different experience. I know, but not Paul. Paul looked at that as an opportunity. And as each one of these guards was rotated over that four-hour shift, each one of them had an opportunity of hearing the gospel, which guaranteed the advancement of the gospel through the entire Praetorian Guard. So there they are with this unique opportunity of being evangelized. They would hear the Apostle Paul as he would pray. They would listen. They couldn't help but listen to the conversations that he had. As he was dictating these letters, they would be overhearing the things that he was saying. And so it became evident, as he says in verse 13, that his chains were in Christ. He's saying, my imprisonment is connected to my faith in Jesus, not that I am a criminal. And not only are the guards listening, but anyone else who has business in Rome who has heard of me is hearing that I am in jail because 
of my witness for Jesus Christ. My chains are in Christ. He says in verse 14, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, his imprisonment actually encourages believers to become bolder in their witness. We need to understand that the Christians in Rome were undergoing persecution. And so as they hear that the mighty apostle Paul is chained for the gospel of Jesus Christ, rather than discouraging them, they see what kind of price he's paying for his faith in Christ. And it actually serves as an encouragement to them. And so as this is taking place, they're, they're beginning to understand the things that Jesus said. Remember Matthew chapter 10, for example, in verse 28. How Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And they're seeing that they have no reason to be afraid of Rome because God is on their side, has greater power. And the Apostle Paul is enduring great affliction and persecution. And as he does so, he's becoming a strong witness, having an opportunity to speak to the entire guard. And so they're now becoming emboldened to preach the word without fear. Now, what's sad about this is verse 15. Notice, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. Preaching Christ from envy and strife. Think about that for a moment. Preaching the gospel out of envy and strife. Their motives? Envy, strife. It may be that they think that Paul was not preaching a message that they really agreed with. It's possible that they thought that he was not giving the kind of message that ought to be given. And they go out and give the message knowing that he says it can add affliction to my chains. The word affliction there, affliction to my chains, it's like the chain is rubbing his skin and it's causing it to have a rash and irritation. And so their motives are to cause more pain, is what he's saying. Their motives are not pure because they may not agree with the things he has to say. They may have their own version. These may be house church leaders who have been busy building their own empires. Paul has never been to Rome. It may be that they're the kinds of people who say, listen, we've been here all this time. He's never been here. Now he's here. He's some big deal. And there are people who think that way. And so their house church leaders, more than likely, who are speaking forth the message, they may be bold, but they do so in order to cause more problems for Paul. It may be that they're jealous over his ministry impact. It may be that they're envious of him. It reminds me of, if you take notes, 3 John verses 9 and 10, there's an individual that's spoken of in that passage by the name of Diotrephes. And John said, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who was a leader, an elder in the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. And not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. You see, there existed some whose greatest desire in the church in the early days was self-promotion. Yeah, they preached. But not with the desire to see people saved. They preached with a desire to injure Paul. Well, others, verse 17, preached God's word with a heart of love for Jesus and for Paul. Because they knew that Paul was appointed for the defense of the gospel. Now, when he says, I've been appointed for the defense of the gospel, it's like the gospel is on trial. And I have been strategically set to defend it in my testimony and in my activity, and indeed the gospel is on trial. It was on trial then, it's on trial now. Anytime you are bold enough to tell somebody about Jesus, you and your message are on trial. You know that, don't you? That's why a lot of people don't talk about Jesus. So, well, I just don't want to make the gospel look bad. In other words, I don't feel like living a better life, so I don't want the gospel to look bad. Well, the bottom line is, when you have sincere and pure motives and you want to live for Jesus Christ, there's no doubt you will fail. I don't know anybody who lives a perfect life outside of me. 
No, I don't know. You're there. Good. I was wondering if you're still with me. I don't know anybody who lives a perfect life outside of Jesus Christ. He's the only one who perfectly lived out his message. You know, even the Apostle Paul, as great as he was, was the first to say, I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived yet. I'm on the, on the road, but I haven't arrived yet. None of the apostles in any way, shape, or form could have said, I've arrived. As great as we see them for what they are, we do see them as great. We see the apostle Peter, what a man, what, what a man's man the apostle was. And he was the same one who, who denied knowing Jesus Christ three times. As great as he was, he still had areas of his life that he needed God's help in. We all do. Not a single individual that I've ever seen in Scripture is perfect. The Bible makes it very clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not a single individual is perfect at all. The only one who is is Jesus Christ. And yet, we have the opportunity to take this gospel and to preach it, to share this message, and to live in such a way that, that our lives give credence to the words that we speak. You see, sometimes people will say, well, don't look at me, you know, I'm imperfect. Uh, actually, as, a, as an attitude of, of making an excuse for continuing in sin, that's never right either. The bottom line is, is uh, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to sin. I'll sin in word. I'll sin in thought. I'll sin in action. I just do, because no matter how hard I, I, I try and how greatly I desire not to, bottom line is, is I'm a person of flesh. And I will fail. There's no doubt about that. That's not some great confession in front of you. You all know that. You're the same way. You may want to do the best that you can, but are you perfect? Well, no, of course not. But at the same time, I believe that we need to live up to the message that we're giving. I give a message of grace because I need God's grace. I speak of the grace of God because I thrive on the grace of God. But grace is not something that is extended to me to continue in sin. Grace has been given to me to set me free from its bondage. So it's not an excuse, but it is a reality. Paul saw the gospel as being on trial, and he saw himself as being placed strategically by God as a defense, to be a witness to what that gospel really is. And so when you see yourself as being strategically placed in the position that you're in, to be one who represents clearly the, the, the gospel and its claims, then you understand what the Apostle Paul is speaking about. You have been placed strategically wherever it is that you find yourself, on your job site, in your neighborhood, in school, in your family. You have strategically been placed there as a defense of the gospel. Your friends, your neighbors, your schoolmates, your family know that you have given your heart to Jesus Christ. They know that if you've opened your mouth and told them. And now you're on trial. The gospel is on trial because they watch you. Paul speaks of us being living letters known and read by all men. We are the living gospel. We live it out in front of people. When you have in your mind this attitude, this attitude of faithfulness to the message, I guarantee you it transforms your life. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. When you actually grow to the point in your mind that you really believe that this message is the only message whereby a man must embrace to be saved and go to heaven. When you really believe that, when you actually get to the point in your life, when you believe your grandmother without Jesus is actually going to perish, when you actually believe that, when you actually believe that mom and dad without Jesus are going to perish, when you honestly believe that, that's where the source of boldness is. You love them enough to tell the truth. You have to love them enough to tell the truth. What is the truth? Well, Grandma, you're a great gal, and I think that God grades on the curve, and because you've been so good and you've made such good meals for me all my life, you've got to get into heaven. Is that the truth? No, the truth is, Grandma, you need Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you, and Grandma, I love you too. And I want to be in heaven with you. And you've been good to me, but I want to be good to you. And I want to tell you the truth. Grandma, you need the Lord. Is there something hard about doing that for a lot of people? It is. Why? Because as grandma, you don't understand. She'll get out her slipper and hit me in the head, and then what? <laughs> but you got to tell them the truth. Love them enough 
And that's what Paul said. I have been strategically set in defense of the gospel. I am a living testimony of the evidence of the power of a saving, graceful God. Why? Because I was breathing out threatenings against this way. I was taking people and putting them in chains, bringing them back to Jerusalem and trying them as heretics. And I witnessed to their death. I persecuted this way to the death. But when Jesus Christ grabbed hold of my life, he transformed me. And I, Paul, who at one time was a, the chief opponent of the gospel, became the chief witness of the gospel because of the power of God. And that's your testimony. And that's what you share. And so he says, I have been placed here strategically to defend the gospel. He says in verse 18, well, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. God is the judge of men's hearts. The thing that matters to me is the name of Jesus is going forth. And according to Romans 2.16, God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the impure motives of others are going to be dealt with by God. And so I rejoice that the name of Jesus goes forth. Let God deal with their motives. He says in verse 19, For I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so, my circumstances that I find myself are leading up to my ultimate salvation. All of this is going to turn out for my well-being. This may turn out for my vindication before men. But the bottom line is, no matter what, God is using this to prepare me for heaven. So whatever I go through, I want it to exalt and magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is going to hear your prayers. And God will strengthen and direct me by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And in that, I can rejoice. Now, notice verse 20, how he says, According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Here's something for you. What is he saying? Jesus won't let me down. Jesus never lets me down. The gospel will be vindicated, and the gospel will be proven trustworthy. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, uh, that is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet, he said, I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. I know whom I have believed. Not only do I know what I believe, I know the one I believe. And uh, in some ways, there's a degree, a dimension, we'll say, that is a bit different. A lot of people may know what they believe, they, they're able, in other words, to talk about Jesus Christ. They're able to point you to scriptures. And they're able to, to give you a defense, an adequate defense, an apologetic of the things that they believe. And therefore, they know a lot of scripture. They can talk to you about the Hebrew. They can talk to you about the Greek. They can speak to you about church tradition. They can give you an awful lot of information about what they believe. And I think that's very important, by the way. I think that every, every student of the word of God should be eventually qualified to be able to give that kind of information, that's a good thing to have. Information is great. I like information, but information without transformation is, is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Information is great, but I have to act on it. And so not only should we know what we believe, of course, that's why we study the Bible. So we know what we believe. So we can say, I most surely believe this. Well, why do you believe that? Well, because God's word says so. Well, why do you believe that? And then you can give an explanation of what you believe. I think that's a good thing. And um, it's not something that only certain individuals who have the ministry of apologetics should be able to do. I think every Bible student ought to be able to give a concise, uh, informative approach to the things that they most surely hold fast to. I mean, after all, uh, that's what helps us to understand how to get to heaven. But I, I don't want to just have information. I want to know him. I want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice how he says in verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I know him. I know that I know that I know him. I have a relationship with him. 
And that's the most important thing, is to know him. Not just what I believe, but to know whom I have believed. And how can I know whom I have believed? By spending time with him. Marie and I were dating, my wife Marie and I were dating. And um, we'd already been going out for some time when I decided that it was important for me to take a trip. So I took a trip down Whittier Boulevard. No, I, I, uh, I don't know where that came from. I, I, all of a sudden, in the back of my head, I heard the song, let's take a trip down Whittier Boulevard. It has nothing to do with this Bible study. It's just an old mind that's kind of out of control. <laughs> I had a friend named Nick, and Nick and I uh, had made a decision prior to Marie and I becoming serious to go to Europe. And so for about a year, we saved to go to Europe. And so I took a year, saved up all of my money, and took off with my friend Nick, and off we went to Europe. And while there, I was still getting to know Marie, so I would write her letters. And we still have those letters that I would write her. And they were basically, we're in, uh, you know, we're in Rome today, and we saw this and that. You know, we're in wherever. You know, we went to nine different countries. We spent three months there backpacking and using the Eurail and the Brit Rail. So we went, uh, we went all over the place for, for three solid months. Spent a, an entire month in Greece and um, just had a great time. But the letters I would send to her, and then she would send me letters back. So in her letters, I would read about what she's been doing, and, and I was learning more about this girl that I was growing to love and all of that. See, it's one thing to be able to read the letter and to get information. It's another thing to be with that person in a personal relationship where I'm hearing it from her mouth and not just from a pen. And a lot of people have information about God that they basically get from a pen. And what I want is something that goes deeper than that. I, I want to know not only what God does, I also want to know why God does what he does. And, and, and that's the difference between knowing the acts of God and the ways of God. You can know the acts of God. God showed his acts to the children of Israel, but he showed his ways to Moses. The children of Israel knew what God did. Moses would tell the children of Israel why God did that. I was talking to a young man today who's been married a couple of years, and, and I said, you know, over time, you get to know your wife pretty well. You know her better than anybody else already. He's been married a couple of years. You know her better than anybody, anybody else already. But over time, you get to learn your wife just by studying her. Now, I've known this young man for a long, long, I've known him since the day he was born. I've known his mama when she was pregnant with him. I mean, I've known this young man for 27 years. And so uh, he knows us well. He's come to our house. He's very dear to me. He's like a son to me in many ways. He's very dear to me. And so he understands us. And I said, so you know, I said, and he's been with me. I said, notice the way I look at Marie. I said, Marie will be talking to me, and I'll be looking at her. And there's two things going on. One is I'm hearing her words. And two, I'm watching her face because her face is telling me which her words aren't, you know, and, and I know. And I said, now let me, let me give you an example. And this is just illustrating knowing something and it's knowing somebody. When Marie and I first got together, something hurt her. And we'd been dating for a few months. And she started to get upset, even tearful. And so I, I put my arms around her to pat her on the back to to try and comfort her. And Marie pushed me. She pushed me away. And she said, I don't like people to hold me when I'm upset. And I said, so I learned something about Marie that day about how she feels when someone's trying to comfort her. I said, I must tell you that I said, I really don't care how you feel about it. And I grabbed her again and held her because I'm somebody who holds you. And you're going to learn that about me. And that was the way it was. I said, so. <laughs> I said, what you do is you learn each other. I said, so if you notice, I'll be looking at her when she walks in, and I'm reading her. I'm reading the way she's acting. I'm hearing the way she's speaking. I'm watching the way she's standing. Because I said, the Apostle Peter taught us 
husbands are supposed to dwell with their wives according to knowledge. And, and, and that's what he's talking about. It's knowing her moods, knowing her ways, knowing the things that please her, knowing the things that don't please her, knowing how to irritate her for fun, and knowing when you ought not to do that. It's those kinds of things that you'll learn in relationship. Now, that's true with the human relationship. It is also true in your walk with God through his word and the time you spend with Jesus Christ. You actually learn the ways of the Lord and how God works in a human life. That's why Paul says, I know whom I have believed. Now, wait a minute, Paul. You didn't walk with Jesus Christ. Jesus had already been dead, buried, resurrected, and ascended before you got saved. So how do you know whom you have believed? Because the Lord, through his spirit, had been communicating to him who he is. He had a personal visitation when the Lord Jesus Christ, there on the road to Damascus, said, why are you persecuting me? And he had a relationship with Jesus Christ that was more than just reading it in a book or listening to somebody else's testimony. He had a relationship with God that was deep and personal, which is what I want. It's one thing to be able to say, oh, you know, I, in the name of, of God whom Paul preaches, that's one thing. But it's another thing to say, I know my God. I know what my God does. I have a relationship with my God. See, that's the difference between religion and what we have. Because it's not just a Sunday only or a Wednesday or whatever. It's an everyday relationship with him. So I know whom I've believed, Paul said, and I have a relationship with him. Now, as we look at this, notice how he says again in verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you, with you all, for your progress and joy of faith, and that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Now, I want to give to you a study that I could have given to you just this bit and really developed it, but I want to give to you a study that relates to living for Christ and dying being gain. That's his singular passion, to live is Christ. That's his chief aim. But what do you mean when you say to die is gain? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What do you mean to die is gain? He's saying death just makes it possible for me to go home. Death makes it possible for me to go home. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about death right now. Oh, boy. In Job 19, verses 25 and 26, we read, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Death will send me home. Notice how he has said, having a desire in verse 23, to depart and be with Christ, he says, is far better. Death held no terror for the Apostle Paul. Because Paul knew that, that his eternity was in the hands of Jesus Christ. He was secure. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, concerning death. There are various, as we know, beliefs related to death. Atheists believe at death nothing happens. It's a well-known phrase, we simply become food for worms. Others believe that souls remain with the body in the grave and continue to fellowship with the living, exercising influence on them and appearing to them. Um, there, are, there are various religious groups that believe that. They believe that when they go to cemeteries and they'll actually bring food for their, their, the spirits of their relatives. We see that in various cultures. Uh, because they believe that they're still being exercised, that that's still influence being exercised on them. It's a form of ancestor worship. 
There are others who think that souls become ghosts. They live in a shadowy world and are simply waiting for somebody to seek them out. And so you have these shows with these psychics who have this, you know, I'm contacting your Uncle Jim, you know. Oh, really? Yes, he's saying something to you right now. What's he saying? He's saying to give me some money. No, I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much it, right? I mean, it's just so phony. Does he still have a limp? Uh, yeah. yeah. Psychics, you know, and they come up and they say the most nonsensical thing and they play on people's hearts and it's terrible and tragic, but that's what they teach. Then a lot of Americans who think that, that there are ghosts out there waiting to be contacted, we know that. Some believe that souls seek out a new habitation. So they may climb into a human or a rock. They may inhabit an animal or a tree. Some believe that souls go to a place called purgatory, junior high ministry. Some believe <laughs> that soul, the soul will sleep. It, they call it soul sleep, obviously, awaiting judgment. Some believe that it's annihilated if it isn't worthy to enter into heaven. Others believe that every soul enters heaven because everyone is good no matter what their lives have been on earth and therefore everybody goes to heaven. This is something I've heard many times. You have too. I've heard many say death is a friend. It's a transitional stage that draws me to final peace and rest. Death is a friend. Let me ask you a question. Is death your friend? That's something to think about for a moment. Is death your friend? People call it their friend. You may find it interesting. Some of you perhaps already know this. Most of you would already know this. But does the Bible call death a friend? No. The Bible does not call death a friend. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The Bible doesn't present death as a friend. It's an enemy. That's why when Jesus was there at the uh, tomb of Lazarus, that's why he wept, because he saw it for what it is. You see, the Bible is plain. The righteous enjoy everlasting life, unrighteous, everlasting punishment. There are only two places waiting for you when you die. There's either heaven or there is hell. I already mentioned Matthew 10, 28, fear not those who kill the body but are able to but are not able to kill the soul, rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So you have heaven or you have hell. There's no in-between place. It's one or the other. And when you read the Bible and you look at the descriptions of this place that it's called, that we just generally call hell, hell is described in various ways. It's called separation from God in Luke 13, 25, and 2 Thessalonians 1. It's called outer darkness in Matthew 22, 13. It's spoken of as eternal or unquenchable fire in Matthew 18, verse 8. Daniel 12, 2 speaks of it as everlasting contempt. Revelation 14, 10, and 11 speaks of it as being everlasting torment. Matthew 25, 46 calls it eternal torment punishment. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9 refers to it as everlasting destruction or ruin. Jesus in Mark 9, 44 said it's a place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 speaks of it as being the wrath of God. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15 speaks of it as being retribution, punishment that's proportionate to the evil that has been done. And Revelation 20, verse 14, speaks of it as being the second death. I've shared this with you before because it's true. Someone was once saying they were going to go to hell because that's where all their friends were. And they were going to party with them all through eternity in hell. But when you read the Bible, the Bible does not say that at all. As a matter of fact, you might find this interesting. The Bible actually speaks, especially in the New Testament, Revelation. The Bible actually speaks, and Jesus spoke more of hell than he did about heaven. He speaks more about hell than he did about heaven. He describes it. He warns people. Why? Why? Because he wants them not to go there. He wants them to be with him. Jesus said in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. 
Jesus wants us to be with him. That's why the Apostle Paul could say that it's actually gain for him. To die is gain. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. See, your whole existence on earth, guys, as believers, is a daily getting to know him better. A daily getting to know him better. Again, to make it a maybe corny to some, practical to others, illustration. The day I got married, I was in love with Marie. There's no comparison. The amount of love that I have for that woman now, no comparison. The amount of love I had for her then. Why is that? It grows every day. Every day, you love her more. Every day, something else you learn about her that infuriates you, but you love her more. Every day. My son Joseph gets married on the 2nd of August. He's been, he's an old timer now. You know, he's been married for several days. And I guarantee you, he loves his Karina more today than he did August 2nd. I guarantee. They've already experienced all these days together, new experiences together that has made them love one another more. That's how it works, guys, when you're in love. When you're in love, it just grows and grows and grows. For us with the Lord, why would it be gain? Well, look around you. What do you have here that you'd rather not go to heaven because of? Oh man, I'm gonna have to leave my house. I'm gonna have to leave my car. I'm gonna have to, mm -hmm. isn't that a great idea? Isn't that good? Oh, it is, it's good. I don't have to weed anymore, bless you, Jesus. I don't have to put gas in that car anymore. Oh, praise the Lord, are you kidding me? What do we have here that is so good that I would miss heaven for? What do you have? What do you have that is so wonderful that you would just as soon look at Jesus and say, you know, to be honest with you, I, I like my job so much more. <laughs> I, I, it doesn't make sense to me, it, it can't. Even, even the most intimate, loving relationship that I have, which is with my wife and my children, pales in comparison to my desire to be with Jesus Christ. Pales, because he's your first love. He's the love that makes all other love possible. You know, Marie knows this. We were just talking about this yesterday. She said, you know, you really ought to share these things with the people, because we talk about this. What has kept her faithful to me and what has kept me faithful to her? A greater love, a greater love. Yeah, she loves me, she better. I love her. But does that keep me faithful to her? Listen, we we're talking about this today. If it was just the amount of love that a person can have for another person, then it is possible for somebody else to come along that you could even care for more. That is possible. Somebody comes along and has that missing ingredient. Because when you're together with somebody long enough, you start seeing the good and the bad, you make adjustments. But what happens when you meet somebody who doesn't have those areas of bad that you're so frustrated with and has all the other good things? You can start getting attracted to that especially when you go to work. You go to work and, and that pretty little thing there, you know, her hair's all combed, she's got perfume on, she brushed her teeth, and when you kiss your wife goodbye, whoa, you know. <laughs> Didn't look anything like that pretty, pretty young thing there. It, 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 there's no comparison, you know. So you can be attracted. You can. There's just this attraction. She's pretty. She laughs at my stupid jokes. She seems to care about me. My wife has been busy with the kids lately. She's not interested in me. But this gal on the job, she is. And she's got everything my wife has, but she's 10 years younger and 20 years lighter. <laughs> and you know what? That's, that's a man for you. Women aren't any different. He's got all his hair. 
men aren't, women aren't much different. You see something, you fantasize about it, you start proceeding after it, and you end up taking it. And when you get it, you realize it wasn't everything it was supposed to be. But when you're in love with Jesus, there's nobody else that is more special than him. And he gives you more love for that one because I have a fear of God and a love for him that motivates my behavior and makes me want to remain faithful to my wife because I believe that God deals with sin. And so I'm not going to enter into sin and lose everything for something that really doesn't matter. So it starts not in my relationship with my wife. It starts in my relationship with my God, the one I want to be with for eternity, who has given me love for strangers, love for my wife, love for my children, love for my grandchildren, family. That's how it works. And so to know him, to have fellowship with him, motivates everything else. So to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Why? Because I'm going to finally be with the one that I'm in love with. And that's why Paul could say that. Now, I want to depart, but it is better for me to remain with you. Why? I can continue ministering to you. You see, that's the heart of a shepherd. My desire would be to be with Jesus, but my priority is to care for you. Now, he was certain he would not be executed, and he would remain for a period of time. He knew that he'd continue ministering to them, and he ultimately expected to see them after his release from prison. That's what he's saying when he says, verse 25, being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. I know that I'm not going to be executed. I know that God is going to release me. I know that I'll have an opportunity to come and minister to you. Though I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, yet it is necessary that I remain with you because the Lord has an unfinished work that I'm supposed to be doing with you, and therefore I expect to remain with you and continue that work until it's completed. And that's the love of a shepherd. His great desire is to be with Jesus, but his ministry is to remain with them.